Hi, hello, and welcome to Harrison Armory, THE galaxy's military industrial complex. Harrison Armory, one of the main manufacturers from the Lancer tabletop RPG, when comparing it to the other manufacturers, lore and just game-wise, they're probably the most faction of the bunch of them. For example, GMS is just a tool underneath Union, IPSN is all about shipping even if it has its own navies, SSC is more concerned with its own craft and private Constellar Worlds project, and Horus is, uh... Horus. None of them are really going out and grabbing territory and really making claims or even going directly against some things in Union or the Kerrigan Trade Baronies or the Onic Force. Except for Harrison. Because while Harrison Armory is a corpo state like a lot of these others, it is definitely leaning into the state side of things a bit more. Doing a bit more than just making products and expanding those products and some private projects, it is actively going out and taking colonial worlds. Mostly peacefully, definitely, definitely does not mind the other option. But that's just to start of comparisons, and to its history, it is the youngest of the main manufacturers, including the ones in-game, not just the lore side of it. DMS, SSC, and IPSN all had their starts around Cradle and Union when it was just beginning in First Com. Harrison Armory didn't start until the Revolution. As in the Civil War, that kicked out SECCOM, brought in Third Com. Harrison Armory is the youngest. It's only been around for a few hundred years, not even a millennia. This is nothing to say that's the smallest or weakest, because it is... Ooh, it is not that. So the story of Harrison Armory starts in blood. So when the Civil War kicked off, things got bad fast. Because while it was a source of general upheaval that began to spring up in different parts of Core Worlds, it was bloody. The revolutionary fervor killed a lot of higher-ups within Cradle. And the hunts and fervor that continued, especially the cleansing of the Navy, really pushed a lot of them to run and hide. And of those fleeing was John Creighton Harrison, or Harrison the First. Easier just to consider the number behind him. And when leaving, landed on the world of Ross Shamra, a GMS foundry world which worked and made the first mechs. It would be here that he would found Harrison Army and be an enclave for any in SETCOM looking to run away. Under Harrison, though. With sympathizers coming in and purges of third com revolutionaries locally, the Harrison Armory was founded at 1AY. Or if we're keeping to the Union calendar, 4515. Because yes, Harrison Armory has its own calendar which most people don't even use anymore. Outside of as described, the enthusiastically patriotic. And it's during this time of galactic chaos within the hegemony that a lot of things began to shift. One of the bigger events was the Interest War. And it's really around this time that Harrison Armory, we're gonna talk more of it like a faction than just a manufacturer as the Interest War begins. Now details sadly are a little loose on it at the moment due to issues. Though to summarize it, Galaxy is in a huge mess, namely the hegemony itself with a lot of infighting still happening within ThirdCom. Because ThirdCom took CentCom, as in they have Cradle, the capital. But amongst the rest of the Core Worlds and Diaspora, it's still a mess. It's described as blink gates going in and out. That is not good. Omnunet disconnections, the galaxy in chaos. And it's during this time that Union itself was still really trying to stabilize what's going on. The Harrison Armory and the Kerrigan Trade Baronies really wanted to take advantage. Looking at all these now unprotected or loosely manned and questionable loyalty worlds and saying, hey, those are ours now. Harrison Armory is from the angle of salvaging whatever they can for SETCOM. Meanwhile, the Kerrigan Trade Baronies, or the Prime Baron at the time was looking to try and renegotiate with Third Com, as in going to take a bunch of their Foundry Worlds, territory, resources, and then renegotiate. Fighting in between all three of these, namely a lot of the fighting itself was handled between Harrison Armory and the Kerrigan Trade Baronies. Union itself too distracted with its own navy fighting itself to really do anything to protect these worlds or intervene in any sense. Though during this conflict, the Kerrigan Trade Baronies begins taking some ground, however they have a loyalty issue. After this fight, Harrison actually holding some ground, committing exterminatus on a world just so Kerrigan Trade Baronies couldn't have it. While it's not called that, it was consistent planetary orbital bombardment until it fractured. And part of the reason this was such a big loss was because Harrison had chassis. Because around the revolution, about 500 years ago, a lot of mechs were still a new thing. But Harrison Armory was founded on the world where it began. So while these other manufacturers and factions might come up and make their own spin-off designs or specializations, Harrison Army was right there on the forefront with pretty much the most pilots. Not to mention, still loyal SECCOM members in the Navy. And all these resources, it just, it's a mess. Harrison I was even upfront within this war, piloting a mech chassis, Saladin, called Fear Killer. I bring that up just because it's really cool and a big propaganda thing in Harrison Armory. But the end of the Interest War, again keeping things very brief, Kirkin Trade Baronies have a lot of internal troubles because a lot of nobility was killed, and Harrison Armory being officially recognized as a corpo state with a trade. The Harrison I remain on Cradle, never to return back to Ra's and be tried a war criminal and executed, which ends the reign of Harrison I in the founding 
and Harrison II begins. So under Harrison II, the armory just begins a lot of its new status quo, with a sweet weapons deal tied to the Union Navy directly after that negotiation, and continuing on and planning out the purview, building up its social system, and something that might change in the future lore-wise. It's in a draft, attempting immortality, with a copy of Galsim, asking this group of bicameral minds to figure out immortality for John Harrison II. The issue with that, this is this is well after the first contact accords, and also the first large-scale documented case of those accords being enforced. To keep it brief and very short, to the detail, uh, Ra came in and really killed Harrison II and a lot of what was going on above Ra Shamra, which will lead into Harrison III. <laughs> and it's with Harrison III that I'll begin to mention these are all not exact copies. And not just honorific names either. As in, yes, they're clones, but they were clones that were made while Harrison was still alive? So Harrison II talked, worked with, and knew Harrison I when he was heading towards his execution. And cloning itself has this other weird tie into it, but in short, rough copy, not a perfect copy, which is why there was research into immortality. Then we have Harrison III, which is the Harrison we're still under, so I'm gonna kinda tie in a lot of stuff under his reign into modern time, Harrison. So before we head into some of the more details about the faction in its modern day, let's talk about the products that it makes for the modern day. Guns, weapons, shields, ships, navy, armor, personnel. Does it constitute violence? Yes. And a bit more. They do actually sell other things. Because while Harrison Armory primarily is an armory, does actually find itself having a, a foot in almost every door. Raw resource extraction being shipped out to different areas. Resource extraction tools even mentions of cars and products of just foodstuffs. The list goes on with some mundane items, but that's because it's not just military, it's empire building. It just sells off the excess. But its primary function is weapons. <laughs> MX, ships, and you know, warfare. Armory, it's in the name. Even when it comes to chassis, I, I just need to express the quality and mass and number. Because while the chassis of the Everest under GMS is the most globally used, or galactically used, I guess, within the hegemony, the second most for warfare is the Sherman, a Harrison Armory mech. This isn't to say anything about their other equipment, satellite stations, ships. While APSN might be more onto the shipping front of it, you know, just travel, transport, maybe resource extraction, Harrison Armory is for the gunboats. And the guns on said boats. While GMS is coming in to fit the galactic standard for everything, Harrison Armory comes in to make it bulletproof. While SSC might be working on perfecting the human form and interaction with the outside world, Harrison Armory is making things, instead of just changing hair color permanently or helping with birth defects, combat stims, enhancements, super soldier programs, cybernetics, specifically for military hardware. And when it comes to Horus, it even has a foot in the door on paracausal and NHP development. Harrison Armory, we're here for warfare. It is the hegemony's imperial power and weapons dealer. And where does this all take place? Where's its capital? Where's the temperate throne? It's all on Ras Shamra. A tightly locked world with a temperate band on the center with a hot and cold side, which is severe. Tidally locked in short, meaning it just doesn't spin. It still orbits its star. It doesn't spin. There isn't just a consistent day-night cycle. It's just a day and a night side, leaving one scorched and the other frozen. And while the temperate band itself might not seem like it has a lot of habitation for, you know, the capital of the galactic power? That's because of an exception. Well, not an exception, it's just built of arcologies. So on the top, fine, pristine, nice botanical gardens, capital places where the nature and landscape and artificial buildings collide, and it is pristine beauty for the higher up corporate nobility of Harrison Armory. And the deeper you go, you head into the stark, artificial depths of the world itself. Giant metallic corridors with brief bits of sunlight filtered through from the top, some small spots of life here and there, but just entirely coated in industrial fabrication. 40k wise, it's a nicer hive city that stretches an entire ring around this world, with the corporate nobility living up at the top and actually out in the open, and the rest living within it. And it's not just in dots or some cities here and there, it entirely rings the world itself, with maglev trains consistently running back and forth. When it comes to the hot and cold side, those aren't just not populated, they are. Cities on the edge, different outposts here and there, different bunkers, and namely, testing sites. As to test Harrison Armory's equipment, it's not just simulation that adds to the pride of its durability. No. Testing it on the cold, hot, lunar moons, and in space. Tons of the planet's surface itself is given up to not just weapons testing, but trooper testing. Pilot testing. They train people here. Not just their own, but serviced. Private contracts to train entire military forces in the distal. 
It's not even just there on the planet itself that the habitation industrialization leaves. The planet itself is ringed with industrial stations. Whether it's building navies, testing ships, testing ship equipment, large-scale mass destruction weapons, paracausal tech, anomalies that they don't want to touch the surface or break out, diseases, or just the straight raw processing of materials brought in from the rest of the system and its local blink gate. Not to mention the orbital harbors and planets keeping track of the colonial legions, hundreds. Harrison Armory's Ra Shamra is a marvel. Not just its integration of the natural landscape and its arcologies up on the surface, but just the sheer scale. Its local production of navies even described not to rival IPSN, but still impressive in comparison. But before leaving Ra Shamra, we have one more thing to talk about here, which is that on the cold side, not only is there still testing here and there, there's also a thing called the Think Tank. So in its current rendition, the Think Tank is comprised of multiple barely just cascading NHPs, consistently getting an inflow of ideas, connection to rest of Harrison Armory, and this consistent back and forth for designing new weapon systems and plans. But then again, due to treaties, negotiations, Union can come in to actually give inspections of the place. But that's also what's aiding in the development of paracausal tech within Harrison Armory, the fact they have multiple barely contain NHPs consistently going back and forth and being a think tank. Oh yeah, sure, just throw the Eldritch Math in a room with itself, that's gonna go well. But heading out, not just its capital world, but the purview. So Harrison Armory's total territory contains more core worlds, not just raw Shamra, empty systems, annex systems, and the purview. So the purview isn't really a proper location yet. They're all systems Harrison Armory plans to add to its territory. Not in it yet. And in spreading the purview itself, you have things like the Colonial Legionate. Or Legion. It said Legionate here, but it's a Legion. Though when you hear Colonial Legion, that's not a good image, which also, just to get across, isn't. It doesn't just mean immediate conquest or guns blazing. Because as a part of the purview and its process of taking worlds and adding them to Harrison Armory proper, Colonial Legions have a section of them themselves divided into AMT, which before the Legion itself arrives, head there early, probably decades in advance, look over the world, find sympathetic elements within the cultures, and then integrate themselves. It's described in the book that these things can become so effective that a lot of Harrison Armory annexations look like civil wars before the Legion properly arrives. Harrison Armory is just usually stepping in, supporting a side, bringing peace, helping with the DOJ under Union, spreading what Union auxiliaries call the Purple Bruise. Seeing the Harrison Armory symbol crop up, and up, and up, and up. It's even described in the book that this gives Union, and particularly the DOJ, Department of Justice, a real headache in determining these, to the point that it is a dreaded position to be a Union administrator assigned to one of these worlds. Openly dreaded, because it's not going to be an easy life for you. This isn't to say everything turns out violent either. There's just proper annexations, welcoming into the fold, sometimes just voluntarily joining the armory. Imagine if you're just a small colony in the middle of nowhere, a single resource extraction world under the Baronies just at the edge of the fringes. Why not join the armory, become a citizen, have a proper rank, the promise of a meritocracy, building of infrastructure, aiding, and speaking of that citizenship, the social. As with its messy annexation and purview policies, we now have some of its messy internal policies. Every person and family has a rank, a social. You know, that whole dark joke in reality of a social credit. Depending on what you do, what you say, any thoughts against the purview or the armory, your social might drop down or go up to the point that you might reach a predefined class or rank. Because let's say you're a new colonial world welcome into the purview. You are a civil service member or a colonial subject, the lowest, the lowest on the social. You don't even count as a citizen yet. There are active rights that you do not have. The way Harrison Armory gets around this is they do offer it. They do still offer basic rights that Union, I mean, Union's not gonna let them take those away. But there were more rights offered and more privileges and more power offered every time you go up those different ranks. Fine and good, the fastest way to head up, service. Service guarantees citizenship. Enlist today. This, this is where the Starship Troopers meme comes in. That's why I keep comparing it. Because literally, service guarantees citizenship within Harrison Armory. Which as you look from the lowest ranks to just general citizen to then managerial classes and ranks, you then enter corporate nobility. <laughs> because your rank on the social isn't just individually bound, but your family? Like again, a citizen having a child, that child is going to be a citizen. Even if in the past life, that person is on a colonial world. Meaning that over 500 years, you have people who were managers and are now just local barons, essentially. Leading up to 12 families back in Rashamra. Most of those 12, by the way, ties to SETCOM. 
And when applying for service, a lot of the people in the higher managerial classes end up taking different officer positions, captain positions, etc. Real World War I nobility aristocracy getting some privileges. It's fine talking about these factions in history, I love it, but when talking about weapons, armor, mechs, chassis, warfare, this is Lancer, the mech tabletop RPG. You want to know about the mechs. Which I can't blame you, honestly. They're really cool. When it comes to Harrison Armory mech naming schemes, namely warfare related. So, first on our list of chassis, the big lad. <laughs> Barbarossa! So the Barbarossa is proper massive. The largest chassis that you can pick up within the game, at size 3, it is this size not just for its armor, weapon mounts, but the one gun. Not its other guns that it can hold, it can hold a lot. But the one gun, the one gun, the apocalypse rail. The weapon itself is attempting to miniaturize a ship-bound weapon. It's still a ship-bound weapon, it's just been now strapped to a chassis, which needs to be this size to hold and fire it. <laughs> Like, as much as it looks like big mech with a single large gun on its shoulder, it's more gun with a big mech holding it. When fully charged, it evaporates. Both rhetorically in the sense that it does 100 AP damage to structures when fully charged, but also it literally evaporates the surroundings around it. The target, not, not the mech itself. But no, if you want to play a slow, lumbering god of war on the battlefield, it's the Barbarossa. Now on to Genghis. Based off the world killer design that was used in Hercinia Crisis to, you know, exterminate and xenocide, the Genghis is the Mark II version of that initial chassis and is still war crime material. It's, it's a lot of flamethrowers. Heat vents, resistant to burn, lots and lots of burn. Pyro from TF2. Lots of cone attacks, lots of fire, lots of burn, plasma. Ooh, working well with overheating and cooling down as in it has explosive vents that can just burst out its heat around it. No, if you really want to terrify your GM, play a Genghis and mix in some stuff from Sherman later on, but specifically, it's because of how burn operates in Lancer. You see, burn has a separate damage type attached to it, which, when applied, it burns. It continues the damage to the next turn. However, burn stacks. So congrats on your initial flamethrower, you did this much burn, they didn't pass the save. Next turn, do that much, now it's doing that again! And it just keeps adding up until they are nothing but molten metal and echoing screams. The Genghis. Iskandor, Iskander, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh no, not you again. Runs into a lot of the paracausal tech side of Harrison Armory, and namely the fact that it manipulates gravity a bit. Sensors here and there, throwing things around, kind of like Black Witch. However, it does this a lot through area of effect and mines, because the other half of this is explosives. Do you want to throw grenades farther? Do you want to be that you throw even more grenades? It's to blow things up. It's to set explosives, grenades, spam explosives. Keep going. Napoleon. Yep, it's uh, it's even called that in reference in the book. It's namely due to its stature. Another basically power armor one and a paracausal mix. The name of the game for the Napoleon is defense. While other mechs might use plasma, energy shielding, bits of hard light prototype tech, Napoleon here just messes with blink. Not in teleporting around to defend itself or just teleport to the battlefield like some other mechs we know. No, it's just making a slight rip or barrier out of blink space. I can only imagine it like scientists going over here and saying, huh, we can't shoot that portal. So what if we just put the portal in front of something? It sends itself into blink space to protect itself, sends other things into blink space to get rid of them, and just generally is really hard to kill for its size. But some of my favorite parts of the license aren't just the chassis itself, but are twofold. One's a mod, one's a weapon. You have a mod that has a projectile come out twice at the same time, as in, the moment you fire it, it's in two places. One, the end of your barrel, and two, directly in front of your target. And the weapon itself, called the Displacer, which doesn't just teleport someone or displace them, it kind of does that. But you pick a radius, and a big sphere of that is now gone. <laughs> as you hurdle it somewhere into blink space. It's not a brief banishment, oh, they're gonna be back. No, 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 they're just gone. And in eerie silence as well, there's not a rip or tear. I mean, this thing's basically a D-gun from the Eldar, which just rips a hole into the warp, but instead of any noise from that, this one is just a... Yeah, not good, no, just hearing the cooldown of that gun, just thinking about being a soldier in that battlefield and all you hear is the cooldown and the silence from radio chatter. Not good. <laughs> Saladin, what Harrison the First wrote in his fear killer. 
Shield, protection, both in being cover and shielding others and yourself. See, this is the one that's the more energy and hard light angle that wasn't the Napoleon. As in, it has projectors, it has hard light berries you can place down, and tachyon shielding. The tachyon shield is fun, it's an equipment you get later on, which allows you that if any projectile hits it, it is reflected to a different target. But no, the charmingly nicknamed Big Sal, the defensive, the buddied, probably the friendliest NHP to cascade on this list. And now for the second most popular frame in all of the galaxy, the Sherman. Which if you played Titanfall 2, it's Ion. A bit more than that, but it does have the big eye laser. Similar to the Genghis, it has systems to help it control its heat, but not to get rid of it altogether and vent it, though it does have some venting, is to keep itself within the danger zone, so it can buff its energy weapons. Cause it's lasers, baby, and also burning. Yeah, this just has more range and direct fire. You want energy shielding, you want to damage them with lasers, you want them to burn, do you want your main upgraded weapon to have a backblast of plasma venting? And not just in theme and like styling and description of its text, no, no, no. If you are in the danger zone, the backblast has a cone attack from behind you. And even just from the styling and description and this picture, it's the Sherman. Who doesn't like Big Laser? The Tokugawa, which, I mean, that's a four-armed mech wielding plasma blades, okay. Its stats, while able to kind of lean into melee a bit, are more about just leaning into energy and danger zone. So danger zone is having your chassis at above or at half of what your heat cap is for the mech. Some of their systems and weapons can benefit from being in the danger zone. The Tokugawa lives in the danger zone. So if you like to live fast and die in explosive reactor death, the Tokugawa is for you, but honestly, it's all about buffing energy weapons within the overcharged danger zone. Harrison gave you this heat cap, abuse it. <laughs> but those are our chassis. Hola. That's Harrison Armory, and sadly, couldn't talk about everything I wanted to. Similar to the Onic Ascendancy, there's some stuff in a draft that allows you to see some other bits that might enter a field guide someday, but sadly it's on a published book, so I kind of wanted to stay away from those things. But outside of that, Thank you for watching, thank you to my patrons, and have a nice day.